Welcome back to the seventh episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including a Democratic official arrested for murdering investigative reporter Goldman Sachs. Where should you park your money? And a cute story about a millennial who's making about $120,000 a year walking dogs in New York City. And, of course, we'll close today with The Daily Delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's get into the stories. The first one comes from The Daily Wire. Democratic official arrested for allegedly murdering investigative reporter. Las Vegas police have arrested Robert Tellis, a local Democrat official, for allegedly murdering a Las Vegas Review Journal investigative reporter, Jeff German. Police executed a search warrant at Tellis' home earlier in the day and returned a few hours later to place him under arrest. Review Journal executive editor Glenn Cook said in a statement that Tellis' arrest was, quote, an enormous relief. End quote, but that the new newspaper is, quote, outraged that a colleague appears to have been killed for reporting on an elected official, end quote. Tellis lost his primary election in June after reporting by German cast a negative light on the county's management. Law enforcement searched the property around 7 a.m. Wednesday morning and cordoned off a portion of Tellis' residence, according to the Las Vegas Review-Journal. A vehicle the police believe is connected to the killing was seen at Tellis' home by Review-Journal reporters. Authorities have said that they believe the killing is to be connected with an altercation between German and an unknown person on Friday. The suspected killer was wearing an orange construction vest and wide brim straw hat. This may have been, he may have been casing the neighborhood for future crimes, according to police. Earlier this year, German reported on several scandals impacting the city under Tellus's management. German broke a story in May revealing that the several current and former employees of Tellus had alleged he created a quote hostile work environment end quote. The reporter also said city workers claimed that Tellus had a, quote, inappropriate relationship with staffer Rebecca Lee Kenton. Footage given to German and published by the Journal Review showed the two, both married, meeting in the backseat of a vehicle. Though he said he was friends with Lee Kennett, Tellus dismissed the accusations as coming from disgruntled, quote, old-timers. Quote, They are unhappy with the way the office has been taken out of their control, end quote, he said at the time. Quote, all my new employees are super happy and everyone's productive and doing well. We've almost doubled productivity in the office, end quote. So just a little sensational story to start us out for the day. I think it's it's sad that we've come to the point that this could even be a possibility And what I mean by that is the fact that it could be reported on in a serious fashion. The allegations of a official possibly being involved in the murder of a reporter, an investigative journalist, it just kind of speaks to the the sad state of our nation that this article could be published in a serious fashion, not in a satirical way. The fact that they could find it as such, the Daily Wire could see it as such pressing news that they would have to talk about it, that the possibility is out there that this man, Tellis, murdered or was involved with the murder of somebody, it's extremely sad. Now that we got the sensational stuff out of the way, let's move into uh, the article coming from Truth Out. Ron Johnson thinks solution to labor shortage is to get retirees working again. I think this article takes a very interesting angle, and we'll discuss it more as we're going through. During a town hall meeting last week, Senator Ron Johnson, Republican from Wisconsin, told listeners that coaxing retired Americans back to the workforce 
with tax incentives could be a, quote, innovative way to deal with so-called, quote, labor shortages. Johnson is currently seeking a third term in the Senate in this year's midterm race, despite promising to retire after two terms. According to the Wisconsin State Journal, he has proposed the idea for seniors to re-enter the workforce numerous times over the past few months and reiterated the call during a recent event in Neanderthal, Wisconsin, claiming it could be the solution for businesses that are struggling to hire and retain workers. Quote, we could encourage seniors to get back in the workforce, those who are able to, by just saying, we're not going to charge you payroll tax. You're not paying it now. Come back into the workforce and we'll waive payroll tax, end quote, Johnson said during the town hall. Economists largely agree that providing better working conditions and higher income to workers is the best way to address this issue, not coaxing seniors back to the workforce by telling them they can return to work without paying income tax. Now, I think Johnson's solution is an interesting one. These seniors, they are currently taking out of the Social Security and Medicare system anyway, which is what a large majority of the payroll taxes go to normally in most states. So they're already taking out of that system. Why would they then have to put money back into that system if they decide to go and work? So I think it's an interesting solution. It, it kind of makes sense. And if they're able to work and their only thing that is keeping them at home is, oh, I can't make the most money possible because this payroll tax, every single time I get a paycheck, it comes out. And it could be a great incentive for some seniors to get back into the workforce. It'll be a pain in the butt for some businesses. They're going to have to spend more money retraining, uh, making sure that systems are able to be managed by people who may not have the technical knowledge that some kids coming out of college or maybe even mid-40s, 50-year-old adults have. So it could be a pain for businesses. But it's an interesting solution to get people into the workforce. The other interesting part that is mentioned here is that economists largely agree that providing better working conditions and higher income to workers is the best way to address the issue. I agree. At a baseline level, if you want more people to work, give them more money. Make sure that they have better conditions at their jobs. Of course, that makes sense. But what they do not mention here, or at least fail to broaden the scope and kind of take in other factors, is inflation is really high right now. And whenever you look at states that raise the minimum wage, people are getting paid more, yes, but over time, the price of goods, the standard of living in the area goes up because now there's more money in that local economy. People have more money to spend. Therefore, businesses can charge more money for their products. It's supply and demand. So... Though they pose this as, oh, he's, he's crazy for proposing this idea, I think it's very an interesting solution that is trying to undercut the inflation problem by not having to pay people more money just to go back and do the same jobs. Back to the article. An untaxed payroll wage would reduce payments to Social Security and Medicare programs that millions of retirees in the U.S. depend on to stay afloat. Yes, in theory, if you're cutting all payroll tax, that's not what he's saying. He's saying cut payroll tax for people that aren't already paying into that system. If they're not already paying into that system, then am I missing something here? They're, they're not going to be taking away anything. I think maybe the argument could be made that giving those jobs that would normally go to younger people who would pay into Social Security and Medicare and they would have to pay those payroll taxes, I could see that as an argument as to how they're taking money out of the systems. But the way they frame it here makes it sound like just those old seniors or those people who are just barely above the age of 65 and aren't working that go back into the workforce, just that alone, if they're not paying payroll taxes, is taking out of the system. And that's not exactly true. I think they would have to explain that more, a little bit more in depth, just to give people reading this or listening 
a little bit more context. Quote, I can see Senator Johnson's plan as having a small positive benefit towards the goal of encouraging older adults to re-enter the workforce, end, state, end quote. Cal Haverson, an assistant professor at the Boston College School of Social Work, said to the State Journal, quote, yet I also worry that the effect on the federal budget overall, in particular the Social Security Retirement Program, which would lose money at a point when Congress still hasn't fixed the projected budget shortfall until 2035, end quote. Democrats panned the idea, pointing out that the policy would be exploitive and harmful to seniors. Lauren Chow, a spokesperson for the Democratic Senate nominee Mandela Barnes, who is running against Johnson this fall, said that the proposal by the GOP lawmaker would be tantamount to, quote, hanging seniors out to dry, end quote. I, to some respect, I could see that if we're taking advantage of them, if we're saying, oh, come back and you're going to get no payroll tax, and that kind of gets them to come out of their shell, come back into the workforce, and then the conditions are terrible for them, or they're doing something that they're not necessarily good at that would have a high learning curve. I could see that. But also, if they're able to go out and work, why is that necessarily a bad thing if they want to take advantage of not having to pay payroll tax? So I can see both sides on this one. Barnes also criticized Johnson over his anti-senior stances. Quote, why is Ron Johnson waging a war on our seniors and the benefits they've worked towards their entire lives? End quote. Barnes asked in a recent tweet. Johnson's proposal comes weeks after he suggested that Medicare and Social Security budgets should be up for early votes next year instead of being automatic, a move that could potentially disrupt benefits for retirees due to the high likelihood of partisan battles over the amounts that should be allocated to the programs. The White House condemned Johnson's idea in August, saying that it would put programs that help millions of Americans, quote, on the chopping block. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, also blasted Johnson's proposal, noting he and other Republicans are, quote, saying the quiet part out loud when it comes to their plans to dismantle social spending programs that retirees depend on. And yeah, I mean, he's not wrong. We know that the Republicans have been gunning for this for quite some time. Uh, there's some interesting arguments from both sides. I think it's an issue that they can't necessarily give up, though. Just like the uh, the abortion issue, when the Republicans won Hobbs, now they're kind of sitting there, oh, one of our key issues is gone? What are we going to campaign on now? Because this Social Security issue has always been a very intriguing one that is enticing for a lot of younger people. They always say, why do I have to pay for blah, blah, blah's retirement? Why do I have to secure my parents' retirement and I'm an only child and I'm paying for two people. It doesn't make any sense. We need to get rid of Social Security. It's always been something that, though it's not a key issue, it is something they can run on and they can kind of relate to younger voters. So it will be interesting if they do get their way. Is it going to be another, oh, I regret taking away that talking point? Or will they love the result? We'll have to see. I don't really see it going anywhere anytime soon. It's a social spending program. And in the United States, once you give something to somebody, it's really hard to take away, especially when it was given to the American people in the 40s. It's over 80 years at this point we've had some of these programs in place, at least Social Security, not necessarily Medicare or Medicaid. So it's going to be a hard one. It's a really hard sell. All right, let's move to this millennial who makes $120,000 a year walking dogs in NYC. After 20 years in the dog walking business, Ryan Stewart says he isn't just a dog person. He sees himself as one of the pack. Stewart started this New York side hustle, Ryan for Dogs, in 2002 and earned money between sparse acting gigs. Now it's his full-time job. He makes roughly $60 per hour walking three to five pups at a time, guaranteed work by a reputation built over multiple decades. Stewart makes up to $120,000 per year. Up to is the keyword there, but that's still extremely impressive. 
He's also living in New York, so he's paying lots of taxes and probably a lot of money for his apartment. According to documents reviewed by CNBC, make it, quote, I don't even think of myself as loving dogs. It's just that they're almost like an extension, end quote. Stewart tells NBC, CNBC, make it, quote, I don't love my right hand, you know. It's just there, end quote. Stewart, who is in his early 40s, says the best part of his job is that, quote, without a college degree, I've managed to make six figures a year doing what I love, end quote. He works roughly 36 hours per week, spread across six days, he says, noting that dogs require constant attention, making his six-hour shifts often feel demanding. Quote, a good dog walker is focused and attentive because you want to prevent your dogs from getting hurt, end quote. Stewart says, you, quote, you have to watch for traffic. You have to watch the dogs so they don't fight each other. You have to make sure that you don't put in your AirPods and listen to music while you're doing it, end quote. Mistakes in his field can be costly. Stewart says, some lapses in focus could lead to a dog's tail getting caught in a door, potentially leading to a $2,000 vet bill. But the benefits of spending his day with dogs, he says, outweigh the cons. Here's how he channeled his connection with dogs into a fulfilling and lucrative day job. A long road to lucrative. Growing up, Stuart's sibling mowed the lawn and set the dinner table. His chore was walking the family's dog. So when he started pursuing professional dancing in New York in his 20s, he thought dog walking could be a natural side hustle. Quote, I remember standing on the street handing out business cards. Stewart says, quote, I just started out like that, one or two for half a year before that became three or four, end quote. After a couple of years, Stewart realized dog walking could be more lucrative if it was his sole focus, but it would be a long road to get there. Despite high demand in large cities, the average dog walker in New York makes $35,625 per year, according to ZipRecruiter. Today, Stewart says he's able to make more because people know his reputation. He charges about 20 to 25 for each dog on a group walk. Roughly half of his clients are from referrals, and with the other half coming from applications submitted on his website. Those applications can pile up, Stewart says. He's very selective of the types of dogs and owners he will work with, and only responds to 10% of requests he receives on his website. Quote, I don't want to go back to the owner and say, I don't want to walk your dog anymore. If you annoy them, maybe they'll write a bad review. End quote. Learning by trial and error. Stewart's schedule on weekdays includes two to three hours of walks in the morning, a break to hydrate and nap, then another two to three hour shift in the afternoon. On Saturdays, he works one to two hours. He takes almost every Sunday off. Stewart has a strict rule for the road when it comes to his business. He always has his own equipment, including four-foot leashes and collars, never harnesses. Quote, I like to have control over the dog's head, he said. Quote, if you have a dog on a harness and there's a chicken bone there and the dog tries to get it, the harness isn't going to be very effective at keeping the head from ducking down and snatching it. But a collar will prevent the dog from doing it, end quote. Stewart says he's does group walks because he feels that it's better for dogs to interact with one another. He occasionally walks some dogs off leash, he adds, which is alarming sometimes to owners. But Stewart says he can tell which dogs are better at paying attention in his 20 years. And he's never had a dog run over by a car, which is a weird fact to throw in there. Why? <laughs> you don't have to say that. I mean, if he's this successful, he probably hasn't. And if you're mentioning him in this article, you're not going to promote somebody that's had a dog run over. So come on. It's a little bit weird to throw that in there. Some of Stewart's methods might perplex dog owners, but he insists he learned from trial and error. He explains to each owner that the method he uses ultimately keep the dog safer, part of why he's built a strong reputation. He has multiple, there are multiple drawbacks to his job, Stewart says. He pays for his own health insurance, he doesn't get paid vacation, and he picks up a lot of poop. <laughs> the most challenging part of his job is involve, involves dealing with dog owners, he added, 
especially since the 2019 year and the COVID-19 pandemic hit, his clients have upped their expectations. Many owners text Stuart to check in during walks, which is his pet peeve, a distraction when he should be focusing on the dogs. Quote, owners are increasingly more demanding and crazier, he says. Quote, there's more cameras, there's more dog trackers. That's a challenge because you feel like people are looking over your shoulder all the time. It just makes it more stressful, end quote. Still, he says the pandemic has given the pet industry a huge boost. The more time you spend around the pets, the more likely you are to spend money on them. And since many dog owners are still tied to their laptops, even if they're technically at home on weekdays, they might need a dog walker. In 2019, the pet industry was worth, wow, $97.1 billion, according to the American Pet Products Association. In 2021, it skyrocketed to $123.6 billion. I think the pet industry is growing because we don't belong to groups as much as we used to, Stewart says. Quote, we don't belong to book clubs or bowling leagues or knitting circles. People stay home more. So where do they put their affection and their need to touch? They do it with their cats and their dogs. End quote. So a cute little article there. $120,000 a year. That, that's impressive. This man has some initiative for sure. And the part I really like is without a college degree. So it shows, even in today's America, where a lot of people think you need to have a college degree, if you grind, if you hustle, and if you're willing to do something that may not be as desirable, then you can make good money. Now, I say not as desirable. Walking dogs, I feel like that's, that's a pretty cool gig. I'm not saying it's not hard, and I'm not saying that I would love to pick up all that poop every single day, 36 hours a week, but it still sounds like a pretty cool gig. You can get out there, walk, burn some calories, stay active, and have a good social life, and you get to interact with dogs all the time. I love dogs, so good for this guy, and he's been working at it for 20 years, and it's always great to see somebody keep working and be successful. All right, we have an article here from Fortune. Goldman Sachs says, here is where to park your cash. U.S. investors haven't had the easiest time in 2022. Tell me about it. Jeez. Whew. The, star, the stock market is ailing. The bond market is having its worst year in history. Major cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin have tanked, and even the once red-hot housing market is beginning to crack. No matter where you look, asset price sets are declining. That means it's been a challenging year for those looking to park some extra cash in a place where it will actually generate a return, to say the least. But a Goldman Sachs team led by Chief U.S. Equity Strategist David J. Cushton gave some advice for investors looking to navigate these treacherous markets in a Tuesday research note. Their counsel centers on an age-old question for stock market investors. Quote, which is better, value stocks or growth stocks? Or what if these days it's neither? And they are going to give us a quick breakdown here of growth versus value stocks. For the uninitiated, value stocks have lower prices relative to their fundamentals than most publicly traded companies, while growth stocks are priced at a much richer valuation because they have growth rates that are significantly higher than the market average. Lyft is a good example of a growth stock. The rideshare giant is expected to grow sales at a 27% clip this year and highly valued by the market, but it posted a negative net income in the spring quarter. The company's growth is the thing to invest in, in other words. Hewlett Packer, HP, on the other hand, is a solid example of a value stock. The multinational tech giant's revenues grew by less than 5% in the spring quarter, but its stock trades at just eight times earnings, compared to the average 13.1 price-to-earnings ratio for the S&P 500. That's a lot of re reliable value there. So think Tesla versus Coke. Tesla, people are investing in it not just because 
It has a lot of good products and people like Tesla because if you look at the fundamentals, a lot of people say, no, no, this stock is highly overvalued. It's going to crash. But it's also taking into the account the future value of the stock and where the company is going. They're building new gigafactories. They're putting in a lot of money into research and development. They're working on AI programs. They're expanding their solar city uh, side of the company so that they can produce more clean energy. So a lot of people are investing in the future growth of the company rather than its current value. And then the other great example, if you know anything about Warren Buffett, he loves them, Coca-Cola. They are a longstanding company. Their returns are pretty consistent, and you know that they're going to be around for a long time. Their growth period is practically over. Mar- the market share there is between two companies for the most part, maybe three if you count Keurig, Dr. Pepper, but it's mainly between Pepsi and Coca-Cola. You either like Pepsi or you like Coca-Cola. It's hard to keep growing the market share, at least in the United States. So that's a, a, an example of a value stock, just in case you need more clarification. Choosing between value and growth stocks is a challenging, a ch- big challenge for most investors. But... The years since the great financial crisis, growth stocks witnessed an incredible era of outperformance led by high-flying tech firms. Now, though, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, the risk of recession rising, and inflation peaking, Goldman says value stocks are about to have their day. Quote, current relative valuations within the equity market imply the value factor will generate strong returns over the medium term. End quote. The Goldman's team wrote, adding the value stocks should outperform growth stocks by about three percentage points over the next year. Investors may want to be cautious investing in growth stocks moving forward because these equities will need a, quote, soft landing and a decline in interest rates to outperform the S&P 500, Goldman argues. On top of that, growth stocks look particularly expensive in terms of earnings and revenue multiples. Quote, Exceptionally evaluated valuations can sometimes be justified by expectations for fast earnings growth. However, expectations today, even if proven accurate, do not appear appear to justify current growth stock multiples, end quote, the Goldman team wrote. The Goldman strategist also noted that value stocks have historically outperformed growth stocks around the start of recessions, and the most economist predicting a U.S. recession this year. And it may make sense to avoid richly priced growth names and seek out value players. So just so we're clear, by the old standard, we have already entered a recession. We have already had two quarters of negative GDP growth. So we're already in a recession by some people's standards. But if you want to go by their new definition... That includes the strength of the job market. Then, no, we haven't entered an official recession by its new definition. So just keep it in mind, growth stocks are probably not going to do as well. And during recession years, value stocks seem to do well. If you think about uh, Coca-Cola here, it is a longstanding brand. It will be hit hard by a recession, but it's also a consumer product. And people are not as likely to cut out their Coca-Cola versus, oh, maybe I shouldn't buy that new Tesla. Maybe I don't need those new solar shingles on the top of my house. People are going to cut back on these more expensive tech firms that have been relying on these high growth rates. And they're going to still buy Coca-Cola. Maybe not as much, but at the end of the day, people during a recession will still buy Coca-Cola. It may be a smaller can. It may be a different size bottle. It may be going to Costco and getting the value pack. But at the end of the day, since it's a consumer product and they've been around for so long, consumers are still likely to buy that even during a recession. Let's get back to the article. However, it's important to note that Goldman's economists still see just a 1 in 3 chance of the U.S. recession over the next year and a 48% chance of recession by September 2024. Still, the Goldman team has pointed out that value stocks have historically outperformed 
growth stocks around peaks in inflation, as measured by the Consumer Price Index. The Goldman's chief economist, Jan Hatzowitz, said in August that he believes inflation has already peaked, and even if it's likely to remain elevated from historical norms through the end of this year. Quote, value has outperformed growth in the 12 months following seven of the last eight year-over-year core CPI inflation peaks. So whenever inflation peaks, for months after that, value outperforms growth. And they wrote this on Wednesday. Of course, there is another possibility investors might want to consider. Goldman didn't mention this strategy in its note and doesn't include stocks at all. Quote, a safe haven. While value stocks may outperform growth stocks over the coming years, many investors are likely unwilling to jump back into the market amid calls for investment banks for, quote, more pain ahead. Morgan Stanley, for example, has repeatedly warned that a toxic economic combination of, quote, fire, inflation, and rising interest rates, and, quote, ice, falling economic growth, are set to keep equity prices subdued until late 2023. Many investors have sought to move cash as a safe haven during these trying times. But Ray Dalio, founder of the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates, argues that, quote, cash is still crash, owing the, to rising inflation. Mark Haffel, chief investment officer at UBS Global Wealth Management, said in a Wednesday research note that there is another option that may be more profitable. Quote, against the current uncertain backdrop, we favor the Swiss franc as the safe haven of choice in fer- foreign exchange markets, he said. Quote, the nation is less impacted by European energy crisis than its neighbors, since fossil fuels only account for 5% of the electricity produced in the country. The currency is also backed by a central bank that is both willing and able to quickly bring inflation back to target, end quote. The Swiss franc has appreciated more than 7% against the euro since June, as rising recession fears continue to drive investors to the safe haven asset. As Stéphane Monnier, chief investment officer for Labard Boyer Private Bank, in August 20, wrote in an August 21 article, the, quote, the Swiss National Bank is countering rising prices with higher interest rates. Unlike other policymakers, it has signaled a willingness to intervene and keep the Swiss franc strong, end quote. The Swiss franc ha- also has a history of outperforming the dollar, which is which its inception in 1999, the franc has gained 30% against the greenback. So if you're looking for an alternative investment that is a little bit safer, maybe look at the Swiss franc. I am not a researcher for Goldman Sachs or any of these other large think tanks, so do not take my word as financial advice. Do your own research, but it doesn't sound half bad. Now, keeping your money tied up in a foreign currency, that always has its own risks. But if we're going to tie it up with anything, I'd love to tie it up with the country that used to be the bank for all the rich people offshore so they can't get taxed. I think they have a pretty good banking system, or at least one that's evasive enough that you're not going to get Big Ben, sorry, Big Brother knocking on your door saying, oh, where's my money? So... Just think about it. Do some research. All right. We've gone through the stories for the day. There's just one more thing. The Daily Delight. This one comes from the animal rescue site. Little girl knocks on door and a horse answers. The relationship kids form with their pets is beyond precious. The bond they can form with each other is unparalleled and can leave a lasting impact on the child and the pet throughout their entire lives. We usually think of dogs and cats as being the primary pets children bond with, but other animals can be just as loving, including horses. Three-year-old Charlotte lives in the USA with her family and her pet horse, Allie. While Allie is significantly larger than Charlotte, it hasn't stopped her from bonding. A sweet video captured a moment Charlotte went looking for Allie, and she knew exactly where to turn, the barn door. 
In the clip, you can see Charlotte knocking on the stable door with a big smile on her face. She's looking up at the top, seemingly knowing what's about to happen. After a few persistent knocks, Allie barges through the top door and peeks his head out to say hello. The abruptness of the answer sends Charlotte into a fit of laughter. It's absolutely adorable to watch. And this video that comes along with this article and all the other articles will be in the description below that like and subscribe button. And with that said, only one more thing. Stay safe. Don't die.